Hi, and welcome to the Time Value Money Chapter 5. Now this is a big chapter. It's a big presentation. Uh, it's going to be broken up into uh, two segments or two weeks or two units, however you want to look at it. Uh, and then I'm going to be covering everything in Chapter 5. Okay, so let's move forward. So our learning goals are we're going to discuss the role of time value in finance, uh, different computational tools and the basic patterns of cash flow. We're going to understand the concepts of future value and present value uh, for single sums. We're going to look at future value and present value for ordinary annuity and annuity due and the present value for perpetuity. We're going to calculate uh, both future and present value streams and mixed streams of cash flows. We're going to understand the compounding interest frequency and we're going to um, Describing the, the process involved in determining the deposits needed to accumulate a future sum, a loan amortization, finding interest in the growth rate, and finding uh, unknown number of periods. Okay, so here's a slide, present value versus um, future value, or as the slide says, future value versus present value. Uh, suppose a firm has an opportunity to spend $15,000 a day on some investment that will produce $17,000 spread out over the next five years. So. Basically, they make an investment, spend $15,000, and this investment is going to produce uh, this series of cash flows for the next five years. So the question is, is this investment wise? Um, on the surface, it seems so, because you're investing $15,000, you're making $17,000. So if we put this on a timeline, we could say that in year zero is when we're spending the $15,000, and here are the cash flows we're earning each year moving forward. Now, if we look at um, discounting and compounding. So compounding is something we do with future value. Discounting is something we do with present value. Now, the way that com compounding and discounting, it all works on a rate of interest. So sometimes this is called an interest rate. For usually future value problems, we say interest rate. Present value problems, we say discount rate. And the nomenclature for the variable would be uh, for this book, it uses R. Many textbooks use I, letter, small letter I, small letter R, and I usually like to use a small letter K. So those are the different symbols. They all mean the rate of interest. Okay, so future value, if we're compounding uh, future value, we'll make a $15,000 payment in year zero, and then uh, first year we earn 3000 and that's going to compound in two, three, four years. So every year we're going to take what the cash flow is and compound it by an interest rate. And if we're discounting the cash flow, we are going to take the cash flow and we're going to actually reduce the amount and bring it back to today's value. So this is basically saying uh, we want to take all the future amounts and discount it back to see what today's value is. Because we know that money in the future is not the same as money in the past. So $100 10 years from now might be worth $50 today. So and money that we invest today will be worth more in the future based on the interest rate. So the interest rate is sort of like the time machine that can transport money values to the future or back to the past. Okay, so electronic spreadsheet, spreadsheets like Excel are the way to go in calculating um, a lot of financial uh, uh, analysis and especially time value of money. So we're going to be using a lot of Excel in this chapter as well as in the spreadsheet that you're going to be working with for this chapter. And it simplifies the calculations and you input variables and they have special um, formulas in Excel to help you calculate these things. Now, cash flow signs. To get the correct answer, you have to know is the cash flowing in or flowing out? Now, we're not going to be working with financial calculators um, for this course because financial calculators is something that is it's not that widely used anymore. That's an ancient technology. Everybody works with Excel now but we still have to enter the cash flows incorrectly. So cash inflows are gonna be a positive number and cash outflows should be represented by a negative number. That makes sense. So the three basic patterns of cash flows. A single sum, which means that we get a lump sum. So if I say lump sum in a, in a, in a spreadsheet problem, like sort of we have, here's our, so I say here lump sum, this is in the, uh, this is the spreadsheet you're gonna be working on. So if I say lump sum here, this is where I'm getting it from. It means a single amount either held currently or expected to receive in a future date. There can be an annuity. So in this, you know, scroll down here and you'll see annuity, future value of annuity. 
and an annuity is a periodic stream of cash flows, a level or even, meaning that the cash flows are all identical, and a mixed stream is going to be unequal stream of cash flows. And so it would look sort of like these are the cash flows and you see how they're all different. So that would be considered a mixed stream of getting all different future cash flows at different rates. Okay, so future value of a single sum. This is the, one of the easiest calculations, I think the easiest to make. Um, so we're looking for a value in the future given the amount of interest I'm going to earn over time. So I'm making a deposit today. I'm going to earn compound interest, which means I'm earning interest, and then the next year I'm earning interest on my principal and interest, and moving forward the money is growing, which we love. We love our money to grow, and we love to see us making investments and getting more money and more money. So the principal is the, is the amount of money with, uh, on which the interest is paid. So once the interest is paid, you know, um, that becomes principal, and next year you get more interest, and so on. So here's a you know, personal, personal finance example. Um, so Fred, uh, you know, he, he places $100 into a savings account and pays 8% interest. Wow, I want to know where this savings account is. And it's compounded annually. So how much will he have at the end of year one? So if you use the future value formula, which is present value, so the $100, the $100 is present value because it's presently being invested, multiplied by one plus the rate of interest. So in one year, he's going to have $108. Uh, duh, I think anybody can figure it out. $100 at 8% interest for a year, $108. Um, but now what if he leaves it in for two years? So we're going to compound it once and then a second time. So it's not 116, it's 116.64 because we're earning 64 cents on the $8 we made the year before. So that would be the future value. Okay, so the formula is to find the future value of n periods, we take the present value, whatever the current investment is, and we multiply it by one plus r to the n. So r is the interest rate and n is the number of periods. Typically years, but it could be, if it's compounded quarterly or, or monthly, it could be um, the year times the, the frequency. Okay. So here's an example. Um, the present value is 800. So we invested $800 into a savings account. And for one, so it's going to enter interest one, interest two, interest three, interest four, interest five. So this is going to grow to $1,070 in five years. So the formula would be 800 times one plus 6% to the fifth exponent because it's, there's, we have five periods. And so 800 times, if we do 1.6 to the fifth exponent, it's 1.33. So 800 times 1.33823 would be how you calculate the $1,000. Okay. So here, I'm going to delete this. Boop, gone. Because that's the financial calculator. <clears throat> I'm not working with that and I'm not showing you how to use that and no one uses it. So we're sticking with Excel. <clears throat> now here's here's a, a quick formula in Excel. So what I'll do here is um, let me just pop up an Excel book here. And okay, so let me just move this value up here. So basically, if we're inputting these values, so we have you know present value, uh, rate of interest, annual rate of interest. Uh, uh, number of years, or n, and then we're trying to calculate future value. <clears throat> so here we have now present value. This is if we make an if we make a um, investment, that's a cash outflow. Which, so that's going to be a payment. Present value is negative eight hundred because we're investing eight hundred dollars. The money is coming out of our cash and into an investment at the rate of six percent for five years. We want to know the future value. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to formulas. And then we could do, um, you can actually go to financial, and that usually lists everything here, and then you can find future value. Now, if you, you could also just go on formulas, insert formula, and then type in future value, go, Oop, the go button's here, go, and then just double click future value. Okay, because um, we're calculating future value of a single sum. So here, we want to put in the rate. N periods, this is N periods, that's equal to N. And then the payment is the, uh, this is not a payment, this is a present value, so I'm gonna put zero in payment. Payment's usually for annuity. Uh, present value here is right here. So, and the type, now the type is either zero or one. Zero is, you know, we're gonna get a pay, is ordinary 
types of payments. We're getting a payment at the end of the period, and one is for payments at the beginning of the period. So then that is explained down here in type. But so this is zero. We only use we only usually use zero. We only use one for annuity due. So let me hit OK. And you see that wow, I calculated the same result. So that's you know how you can use Excel to calculate the future value of a single sum. And you could also, if you wanted to use the formula, you could just say plus negative eight hundred. Um, I'm just going to say eight hundred times one point oh six, and then you uh, above the six key is this caret that you could that's called a caret, and that can that denotes an exponent. So I'm going to do it to n periods. So here I calculated it using Excel, uh, just putting in the time value money formula. So when you use the time value money formulas, you don't have to change the I'm not changing the negative sign here, but when we use the, uh, the spreadsheet formulas, we have to know the present value is usually payment and future value is usually um, uh, receiving of cash, so that's a positive amount. Okay, let's put this away. Here's a relationship of future value. So the longer you have money invested, the, the more compounding you get. And if this is the future value of $1, so in 24 periods at a 20% return, that $1 turns to $80. And, and then just going from 20 to 15 percent, we go from 80 to about 30 dollars. And if we go to 10 percent, we're going to 10. So you see, the power of compounding really escalates the value of your money. Let's switch over to present value. Uh, here, we're, present value is looking. This is a harder concept because you're used to future value because you know um, I make an investment and I'm going to earn interest. My interest is going to earn interest, and I have a future amount that's larger. Present value is looking at money we're going to, future money that we want to bring back to today's value. So if I tell you, you've won the lottery and I'm going to pay you a million dollars, but in 20 years from today, you want to know, well, what is that really worth today? Because we have to discount it given on the interest rate uh, of inflation, that inflation would deteriorate the value of that money through time. So we want to see well, what's the equivalent today. Just like, you know, a house today is 400000 a house 30 years ago was 50000 and it's, that's the process of money changes in time. So present value helps to convert money so you can look at it at like terms. So we like in present value, we call things discounting cash flows because we want to reduce the cash flows based on um, sort of reverse compounding or inverse compounding uh, interest. We're, we're, we're taking out the factor of inflation basically. So the discount rate refers to an opportunity cost um, and the discount rate uh, it can be thought of sometimes as, as the cost of capital. It, discount rate is an interest rate, but we're using it to reduce the, the amount of money, uh, or the future amounts of money to today's term. So we could say that if I get $100 in 10 years, that's worth $50 today, and they're both equal because $50 today will buy the same amount of goods and services at $50, as $100 10 years from now, as an example. Here's some personal finance. Um, Paul has an opportunity to receive $300 a year from now and he can earn, if he can earn 6% on his investments today, uh, what is the most he should pay for this opportunity? So we just put it into the model here where we, um, and there's a little mistake here. This, this, is, this shouldn't be multiply and this should be a divide. <laughs> there's sometimes these little mistakes in these spreadsheet, in these presentations, sorry. Um, okay, so you take the three hundred dollars. Oh wait, maybe that wasn't a mistake. I'm sorry. Let me just see what they're doing here. Present value times. Okay, that wasn't a mistake. I'm sorry. My bad. Because um, they're showing you the other side. This is calculating the um, future value is three hundred. So if you take uh, the present value, this is the future value formula. If you take the present value times one, one plus the rate of interest, and this is, this is really to period one, but we're not showing the exponent because uh, it doesn't, the one isn't going to change anything. To three is $300, but the present value, <clears throat> we take the 300 divided by one plus six to the first power, and it means that today's, today, that $300 is worth $283. Okay, so here is the formula. 
So this is this is why I thought it because oh, you always divide with present value. That's why I got confused. I didn't know they were showing the future value formula here. Um, so the present value formula is present value equals future value divided by one plus r to the n. And that is, if you notice, that's the inverse of the future value formula. So they're really two sides of the same coin. All right, so let's look at a present value of a single sum. Now we're going to get, so this, this example is we're going to get, um, he wants to find the present value of $1,700 that were received eight years from now and the opportunity cost is 8%. So that the interest rate, opportunity cost, or discount rate is 8%. So the formula would be, you know, 1,700 divided by 1.08, 1 plus 0 0.08 to the eighth power. And that would equal $917 would be the present value. So receiving $1,700 eight years from now is the same as receiving $918 today. And so this is, would be the time scale. If we look at, this is a future value amount, 17 is worth, eight years is worth 1,700, today is worth $918. Okay, Oop, get rid of that. Here is the, um, present value of a single amount. If you were to do it in Excel, you can easily, you know, pop this into Excel. And we'll do I'm going to put a future value on top. And we're trying to solve for present value now. And the future value is Interest rate 8%, eight periods, and we calculate future value. So again, we can go to the formula page, insert function, and we want to select present value, and we have the, the rate and periods. We have the, um, we, we, you don't have the payment. We have the future value. Payments are things that are for annuities, and the type would be zero, because it's an ordinary compounding. Okay, and then we calculate the present value. And of course, as we saw in the previous slide, you could do just the present value formula to calculate that same result. Okay, and here's the relationship. This is, if you have the higher your discount rate, the more your money deteriorates over, over time. So your dollar will deteriorate the higher your discount rate. Makes sense, the more you're discounting, the more your money goes down. And this is sort of the inverse of the future value chart. Now let's talk about annuity. So annuity here, it's a stream of equal periodic cash flows. So, so it's like receiving um, $200 every week for 52 weeks or $5,000 a year for 20 years. Uh, the cash flows can be inflows of, you know, investments or outflows of, you know, um, funds that are going to be invested for a future return and you have the ordinary annuity which means that most of what we calculate are considered ordinary which means the cash flows occur at the end of each period it's like you get your interest at the end of the year annuity due um although interest is you know that's something different but i'm just saying that the cash flow is coming at the end of the year annuity due the cash flow becomes at the beginning of the year so your paycheck is sort of like an ordinary annuity because you get paid at the end of you know, the two week, when you work the two weeks, you get paid at the end. So you don't get paid, you start your day job, you start your job day one, you don't get a paycheck, but you work two weeks, in the two weeks you get a paycheck. That's an ordinary annuity. Annuity due would be, they pay you before you even work. So you get the money in the very beginning of the period. And annuity due is always greater than the ordinary annuity given the same inputs. Okay. So uh, Fran here, she chooses to, um, choosing which two annuities to receive? Uh, both are five-year annuities. One is for a uh, for a thousand-dollar annuities. Annuity A is an ordinary annuity. Annuity B is annuity due. Um, Fran list the cash flows for both annuities as shown. And okay, so here's the ordinary annuity. Uh, the cash flow goes in at the end of year of the, of of year one, and then so that goes from cash flow of year to five. In the ordinary due, the cash flow goes in the beginning of year one, which is technically year zero. So you see it's still five cash flows of $1,000, but one starting off earlier and, and ending zero. So if we look at the, um, 
if we if we, if we were to calculate this, <clears throat> annuity due is going to be more because we're getting we're going to earn interest in a thousand dollars a year earlier um, than an ordinary annuity. So that's why annuity due is always more money because we're earning our interest earlier, a year earlier. Okay. Now, if we want to calculate annuity due, or sorry, ordinary annuity, we're back to ordinary annuity. If we want to calculate an ordinary annuity, the future value of the annuity, we have this nice little formula. Since the cash flows are equal, we can put it into one formula and just be cash flow times um, 1 plus r to the n minus 1 divided by r. So that's the, the equation. Okay, so if we're looking at as Fran's example here, um, so this is the ordinary annuity because the payment starts in year one, not zero. And we see that for you know pay, year one, the thousand dollars grows to thirteen hundred because there's the most time to compound. Year two, three, and the last year there's zero compounding because you get the you get the payment at the end of year five and then it's done. <clears throat> there's no interest. <clears throat> so the total future value here is five hundred and seventy dollars. <clears throat> five hundred five thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars, I'm sorry. So basically, she's investing. Five, she's getting five thousand, but she's getting seven hundred and fifty dollars of interest. All right. <clears throat> now, for a spreadsheet, if we wanted to do a um, annuity to do problem in the spreadsheet, this I'm sorry, ordinary annuity in the spreadsheet, what we would do is let me just pull up. We would use the same. We'd use the, basically the same formula. So. But we would have something called a uh, payment. So we have a payment of, because we're, we're paying $1,000 into the investment. That's why it's negative for the spreadsheet. R would be 7%. N would be 5. And we're looking to find the future value of annuity. OK, so here, when we, um, we can use that same formula. So let's insert formula future value. So now um, what we're doing here is the rate R n periods n and now payment. So this time we're using payment. We don't have a present value and the type is zero because this is an ordinary annuity. And you see how we calculate the value. So that's how you can do it in Excel. And you see Excel is faster but you should be familiar with the formulas. Uh, luckily for you uh, when you take the test, it's um, an open book test, so you have the formulas, and since I'm letting you take the test on a computer, you can also use Excel to help calculate. So you need to, if you're utilizing Excel when you're doing the test, you'll be able to do the test a lot faster. If you have to do everything written out by, you know, calculator, pen, and pencil, it's going to take you a lot longer. So that's why I'm taking the time to go over Excel, because I want you to utilize Excel in solving the homework, and the spreadsheet problems for the class will make your life a lot easier and also make you more functional in, in Excel, which will make you more attractive on the job market. Okay, so finding the present value of an ordinary annuity. Did I go backwards here? All right. Okay, we're doing present value. This was future value of ordinary annuity. Now we're going to do present value of ordinary annuity. So to calculate the present value of an ordinary annuity, we're going to look at uh, this formula. So it's a slightly different formula because it's the inverse. So we're now, it's cash flow divided by R multiplied by 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus R to the N. So when you're putting this into Excel, the order of operations and the bracket the parentheses you have to put around these formulas can get pretty, pretty challenging. Uh, but I've done it. It's, it's doable. Uh, but here we're, we're looking to calculate the present value of a stream of future cash flows. So Here's the example. A uh, small producer of plastic toys wants to determine the amount. The most it should pay for purchasing a particular annuity. An annuity consists of a cash flow <clears throat> of $700 every year for five years. And we're going to use a, um, an annuity. We're going to pro provide a uh, discount rate of 8%. So the situation would show that um, in year five, this money gets discounted the most because it's the fur furthest away from having it. So that goes down to $400. But in the first year, it's 650 in each year when we add up all the years individually and we get the two, uh, 2794. So this would be as if we calculated each year as a single sum, but this is an annuity. So even though you take five times 700, it's 3500, but it's discounted down to about 2800. 
So this is so yeah. So if we were to break it out using the single sum formula of present value, we could calculate each of them individually. And it's sort of what we do for the mixed stream: calculate each individually and add them up as a sum. But what's nicer to do is to use that formula or to use a spreadsheet. So if we want to do a present value of an annuity, um, again, we're going to calculate the payment is 700. The rate of interest is 8% and it's for five periods. So, and we're trying to find the present value of annuity. So again, we could use our, our formula and we use a present value formula and we have our rate and periods is five payment is 700 we don't know the future value um, and type is zero and we get the uh, present value of annuity <clears throat> which is here expressed as uh, a negative number which is okay that's how Excel works all right And it says here the minus sign appears before because F5, the annuity present value is a cost, therefore a cash outflow. And that's why we have a negative sign. But I, I would, um, yeah, just be cognizant of that. All right, finding the future value of annuity due. Okay, so we're going to do uh, the future value of annuity due, which is basically the same formula, but we're multiplying 1 plus R at the end to denote the one extra year of interest we're getting. Okay, so this means, remember, annuity due, the payments become, in, become, we get the first payment in the beginning of the year. So we get to earn interest on every payment for one extra year um, when we calculate the annuity due. So um, if we're going to use a formula to calculate the annuity due, let me just move this up. So I have room. All right, so if we're going to do a, a formula for annuity due, we have our payment, we have our rate of interest, a so number of years, and we're looking for future value of annuity. So I put in our payment, our rate of interest, period. So this is an annuity due problem. So when we calculate, when we insert the formula, future value, we're going to put in again the rate and periods, the payment, and we don't have the present value. But here, instead of selecting zero, we're selecting one, and that's the um, payments at the beginning of the period equal one. So here we're putting one for the first time to denote annuity due. Okay, and that's how you calculate the annuity due using the Excel spreadsheet because we have, and it's just that zero one. So it's either ordinary or annuity due. Zero is the ordinary type, and one is annuity due type. And that's how you can use Excel to calculate the annuity due. Okay. So uh, if you do an ordinary annuity, so back here, previously we calculated, this was the ordinary annuity, that was 5,700, remember, or an ordinary annuity that we calculated. So the ordinary annuity is, lower than the annuity due. So same series of cash flows, it's just that we get one extra year of interest on the annuity due, um, so it's always higher. And now let's get the present value of annuity. Remember the annuity is a continuous stream of uh, returns. And um, to get the annuity due, we take the uh, present value of annuity formula and multiply it by one plus R. So in the spreadsheet, make this bigger we could calculate this so this is what we had um, previously so I'm going to copy this over and put like a nice box around it okay so now this was the ordinary annuity let's put OA ordinary annuity and this is what we call an annuity due so when we calculate the formula, use the present value, and our, we're going to put in our rate, Oops. 
in our payment and no future value type is one okay so you see how the using this formula we had type zero and you can see here the type is this last cell here in the formula bar and this the type cell is one which means annuity due and you can see the difference and then you do annuity due is bigger well it's a negative number so it's smaller but you, you get what I mean okay okay so uh, a truck driver um, we we'll call him Donald Damon uh, interesting name got the surprise of his life when he learned he held the winning ticket to the Powerball lottery uh, in 2009 and his jackpot was 96.6 .6 million and he could have chosen to collect his prize in 30 annual payments of 3.22 million um, which is the 96.6 .6 million so if you multiply 30 times those payments he gets the full amount of the winnings but he elected instead to get a lump sum payment of 48 million a half of his jackpot total so was that wise to do that well the idea is say you could take this money this 48 million all right so let's take that and put this in excel and we'll say that that is that's the um that's going to be the present value would be the uh, 48 million Okay, so this is the present value, but we're going to put a, a negative sign here. Oops. Okay, I'm going to say that he could put that in the stock market, earning uh, a 10 percent rate of interest for 30 years. He can grow that money to uh, 800 million. So that's pretty smart. But what if his interest rate was only one percent, two percent, two two point five. Okay, so it looks like the the lottery is escalate um, the, the lottery interest rate for going to getting to the ninety six million is around zero point zero point two three three maybe that's pretty close. Um, so if he feels so if you feel you can get a better rate of interest than two percent over 30 years which he obviously did and probably maybe we'll say six percent would be a a very conservative rate if you invested your money in bonds and some stocks over 30 years he still would have 277 million earned on that money uh so the moral of this story is if you win a big jackpot always take the lump sum payment because you can always invest it at a higher amount of return than what the the, the lottery companies do which is usually just treasury bills okay matter of fact okay let's pause the lecture here this is the end of part one and i will start here for part two